Do it live before YouTube gets too angry at me. It's pesty. Okay. <laughs> we are now live. So uh, that's the be that means it's the beginning of the show. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Awesome Hardware. This is the live show where we talk about technology and whatever the heck else we want to discuss. We usually stream Tuesday evenings at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time, give or take 15 minutes to half an hour. Uh, today we're we're almost on time, and uh, I'm joined by Kyle, aka Bitwit. He's joining me remotely over there because we are still maintaining social distancing, yes. and uh, we also occasionally use adult language on the show, and we in typically enjoy a, a frosty beer. Uh, I am I'm gonna have this uh, Jackie O's Pub and Brewery Who Cooks for You Double Dry Hopped Hazy Pale Ale, uh, which that's a mouthful, which should be delicious. Uh, and this was sent to us by a fan, and. I meant to write down the fans' names so I could thank them, but we thanked them when I opened it last week. So wait, you'll have uh, to you'll have to drink it. Uh, I, ha I know. Dang it, I enjoy know. it vicariously through you, Paul. Yes, there is. Enjoy the uh, the fan beer. There is one more that's an IPA that's supposed to be more for Kyle, but we'll see because I uh, don't have very much beer today. In fact, I only have these two. So if I finish this one and I decide I want another one, I might have to go and drink Kyle's IPA. That's fine. Uh, that's, I. Uh, I have a couple beers left here. I'm drinking a, a Citra Pale Ale from El Segundo oh. Brewing, which is very tasty. Um, but uh, Wifey Sauce went to the market today, and when she came back, she, she brought home a, like a fifth of tequila. Oh, well. I think she's trying to kill me. I but see. then I also realized it's, it's Cinco de Mayo, so that's probably why she That is it. true. It is Cinco de Mayo. Happy, happy Cinco de Mayo. Uh, yeah. It's, it's a good day. Good day Almost to... as good as May the 4th. You're right. Yesterday. May the 4th was yesterday. That's it's a good day, Star Wars yes. day. It's yes, also it my daughter's birthday. Yes, um, I was gonna say uh, I was gonna say that, but I wasn't sure if you wanted to reveal that on stream. So. Yeah, we uh, we had a quarantine birthday party for her, and at the end of the day, she had a cupcake and she smeared it all over her face. It was very cute. It's, it's the way to live your your best life, right there. Thank oh, you, honey. Oh, but wow. cheers. cheers, cheers. I meant to say. Kyle just got a new drink, so cheers. I just got a new drink while I'm still working on this one. This is like, I'm in heaven right now. Right. Thanks, honey. So Kyle should be having a good time. Uh, cheers. Cheers to you guys. Thanks for joining us. What is this? Bloody Maria. It's a Bloody Maria. Ah, Kyle's having a Bloody Maria. What's with all these women? With, let's start with the letter M. Why are they all bloody? Ooh, that's good. That, nice job. It sounds good. Uh, quick plug to the stores, paulsarbert.net for mine and uh, bitwit.tech for Kyle's. If you buy stuff during the show, we'll give you a shout out during the after party. We're de-emphasizing that a little bit these days. Not the stores, it's good merch. We're just trying not to go on and on plugging the stores at the beginning of the show. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to talk about tech news, though, today. And if you saw the headline, there's some interesting stuff actually coming out. Uh, some of it's rumors and, and whatnot, but uh, we like to at least discuss those while, of course, maintaining that everyone knows that these are rumors and they might be fake or they might be real. Maybe they're leaks that the companies put out intentionally as a leak, but they're, mm -hmm. they're actually promotional materials. We don't know any of that stuff. Uh, we're just going to discuss it anyway and say whether or not we think it, it might actually be true. Uh, so, so here we go with the news seg section and starting out with uh, an article from over on TechSpot by Rob about 12th Gen Alder Lake, uh, which are now being rumored to use the LGA 1700 socket. No! Yeah, LGA 1700, <laughs> and if you're like, wait, 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 I just heard of LGA 1200 this past uh, week, you're right. And this is kind of a quick, a, a pretty quick follow-up to that. But to be fair, everyone has been asking Intel for the past, I don't know, three, four years, ever since they originally talked about 10 nanometer stuff what, in like 2015 or 2016? Like, when's it coming out? When are we going to get it? What's the platform? What are the details? And so they keep pushing stuff back and pushing stuff back and be like, no, here's more 14 nanometer. Here's more 14 nanometer. Hey, you know that CPU microarchitecture we're working on for 10 nanometer? Hey, we, we made it 14 nanometer. That's going to be Rocket Lake. <laughs> like, that's, that's what they've been doing over and over again. Um, so anyway, in like two weeks, a little over two weeks on the 20th, uh, Intel is launching their 10th gen. So right now we're on 9th gen. In a couple weeks, 10th gen is launching. Uh, there's a whole lineup of CPUs. I did a video on it. Kyle did a video on it. If you guys want to check them out and get some some of our re responses to that, uh, going over the CPU lineup and everything, there's some interesting stuff. You know, they're bumping up to 10 cores uh, on the mainstream socket, which is better than 8. Still not 16 or even 12, which uh, AMD has, but better. 
Uh, and then, what else? Uh, I don't know. You get a little hyper threading. You get hyper threading down the stack to, with the i threes, so that's kind of interesting. That's prices aren't great, but they're less aggressive than they have been in the past. More aggr- less. They're less horrible. They're slightly they're less, less horrible. Slightly, yeah, less, slightly horrible. less horrible. So you can get a little bit more for your money on the Intel side of things. It's still, again, it's just hard to recommend it when AMD has the AM4 platform that they've already told us, yeah, we're going to have more CPUs on this, or another series. I like it that AMD has been telling us about the forward compatibility, whereas on the Intel side, Intel still seems to not want to commit to that. They don't want to say that outright. And we're going to talk about uh, compatibility with Rocket Lake and PCIe 4.0 on the LGA 1200 stuff in just a second. But um, a little bit more on this. Where where did it come from? Uh, the This is sourced from a company called Lit Tech. LIT-Tech, which is a Taiwanese-based company. They provide voltage regulation test tools to Intel in the Asia-Pacific market, and they have basically just gone and, and listed uh, a bunch of info about, about these processors. Um, yeah, they, they, they uh, listed a number of the CPUs. They listed the code name Alder Lake S, uh, which would be a desktop CPU, uh, if it, they're going by the current naming scheme, uh, and info revealing, of course, the LGA1700 socket, which would be a new socket, which would need a new motherboard. Um, so yeah, with LGA1200 right now, that's what I ca- ca- what I asked Intel multiple times was like, are you guys making any commitments about how long the longevity of this platform? Because that's something that we keep praising AMD for. Thank you for mm-hmm. for you know keeping AM4 around for so long, um, and they seem to not want to say for sure. Uh, it does seem like Rocket Lake is going to slot into LJ1200, and it does seem like Rocket Lake is going to be able to provide PCIe 4.0 uh, to some degree. So that's cool. But for uh, fuller support and for, I guess, next gen, and I guess for maybe 10 nanometer or maybe 7 nanometer stuff, because there's a lot of rumors also that Intel's just going to completely skip 10 nanometer now and go to 7, which mm-hmm. would be fine with me. I don't I don't care. I just want them to get off 14. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so th- this would potentially mean that these new LGA 1200 motherboards that are coming out might be supplanted probably not next year because we're looking at uh, Rocket Lake in 2021, but maybe 2022 or maybe late 2021, you might have these LGA uh, 1700 motherboards. LGA 1200 did maintain backwards compatibility with uh, the socket size and coolers, so that's kind of convenient for a lot of the established market since LGA 115X has been around. They've maintained that same mount. Uh, it does appear like LGA 1700 is changing the actual uh, size of the socket, uh, and they're going instead of a 37.5 by 37.5 millimeter square design, it's going to be more rectangular, 45 millimeters by 30, so about the same width but taller. Hmm. Uh, so maybe a little bit rectangular shaped, which Interesting. seems like it would break compatibility with existing coolers. So we'll see how that uh, plays out. But this is rumored to launch in early 2022, according to the article. It will probably be supporting next gen Intel or next next gen 12th gen uh, Intel processors, which maybe will finally be 10 nanometer or maybe even 7 nanometer. All that stuff is still in the hazy future. Uh, also, mm. rumored things about this Alder Lake platform that are interesting. Uh, they might use a mix of big and little cores. Hmm. Kind of, kind of like ARM has done o- over on the mobile side. For so that that could be interesting. They might have eight high-powered cores and eight energy-efficient cores, and then one integrated graphics unit, or however they describe that. So like an eight plus eight plus one setup. I could see that being interesting um, since efficiency. Is important. I mean, I'd rather have all the cores just be able to use more power and go faster, or just throttle right. themselves back. But there yeah. might be some advantage to physically making the cores smaller uh, or, or or different in certain ways. Not to be too technical, <laughs> but uh, later if they're cheaper. Maybe if they're if they're cheaper to make, that yeah, could be competitive. Yeah, I mean, if they can make, if there's one. I mean, and I think the, I think the chiplet design that AMD has been doing with you know little chiplets, I could see that going out. So you'd have you'd have some chiplets that are the big cores, the fast cores, and you have some chiplets that are the, the high efficiency ones. Right. Yeah, you know, there's a, you could see that there being advantages there. It's just always a question of how good are the you know how much benefit does it provide? Uh, what's the actual performance against the competition? And whatever AMD is rolling with in late 21, 2021 or early twenty twenty two. 
Uh, also... I wonder. I, I wonder if that's maybe a response to like just like really high quality silicon on ten nanometer or seven nanometer being difficult to yield. You know what I mean? Like maybe that's a workaround where if like the if the yields are really crap on that manufacturing process, that could be a, a way that they're circumventing it by having high and, and low efficiency cores, big and little cores or whatever. Just a thought. That's also a possibility, but we will have to wait and see. Oh, my daughter My daughter just walked over with a box of baby wipes, and she's just scowling at me. She's giving... <laughs> you were about to say baby oil. I was like, No, baby, baby wipes. Okay, It's an empty God. box. Much less threatening. She's so cute. She's one year old now. She's one. Crazy. I, I can't know. believe she's one. It's insane. Uh, she's, so she's awesome, though. Okay. Um, later versions. This is also a weird thing. It says later versions might support PCIe 5.0 and DDR5 RAM. Um... I feel like this is a later version since we're talking about something that's probably not out for a year and a half or two years. So I would hope that they would start with that support maybe if they are going to be switching over to DDR5, which we are expecting soon. I I'm guessing whatever the follow-up to AM4, maybe AM5 from AMD is going to be supporting DDR5 and all that good stuff. And PCIe 5.0. It's 5. Five's all around. AM5. I know. PCIe Express 5. DDR5. The year of 5. Um, 5. I don't know what else. They should have waited till 2025 things to launch. You're right. They should. They should just <laughs> it push. Been totally worth just pushing, hold that up. Pushing back for you. Let Intel completely catch back up. Level the playing field again. All right. Let's move on uh, to the story I was briefly referring to. Uh, this is also a TechSpot article about these Z490 motherboards that have come out. Tons and tons and tons of Z490 motherboards being announced everywhere. All the manufacturers are like, hey, check out our Z490 motherboards. Uh, Gigabyte did this Oris event thing, which I guess is a live event, which has a half an hour of dead time at the beginning of it. Nice. That's fun. Anyway, they, they, did, a li they did an Oris live stream where they talked about their stuff. This doesn't want to load. That's fine. I don't care. Oh, look. There, there it is. Oris has memory now. Anyway, uh, so they, they said some stuff directly, I think in reference to some questions that were asked in the live stream that Intel was not willing to uh, to say directly, which is, for one, uh, that Intel... Well, all right, so this is from the article. The article says that Intel scrapped plans to offer PCIe 4.0 support with Comet Lake S CPUs, opting instead to deliver that with Rocket Lake in 2021. That's directly from the article. I don't know where that information comes from. I mean, it seems like that would make some sense to me. A four, PCIe 4.0 support is definitely something that Intel would want to have, to, uh, to, to compete with AMD and everything. But it does seem like they are pushing for PCIe 4.0 support with Rocket Lake, uh, the 11th gen core CPUs that Intel will be launching, which, uh, if these rumors are true, should slot into LGA 1200 motherboards. And um, Intel just, uh, they didn't, if, again, assuming this is true and that Gigabyte's not just making stuff up, which wouldn't make a lot of sense to me, uh, like, why wouldn't they say this? Why wouldn't they come out with this and say, even like that statement that AMD made when they first launched AM4 was like, this is our platform through 2020. That's all they said. They gave a year. Yeah. And by that year, you could infer some stuff like, all right, they're probably going to launch more families of CPUs down the line. And then, they, and then they kept up with it. All I want Intel to do is just give us something like that that says right. like, hey, for people who are thinking about buying this, but who are looking at that comparison of like, how long is this going to last me? Am I going to be able to upgrade on it if all I can afford is like one of their new quad cores right now or something like that? Um, what are what what can I do with this in the future? Am I going to be? Is it going to be a dead end platform? Um, Intel apparently does not want to come out and state that directly, but Gigabyte has, and that's where the information comes from. Uh, but it's also why a lot of motherboard manufacturers are referring to their Z490 motherboards as PCIe 4.0 ready. It's because, theoretically, these Rocket Lake CPUs, the 11th gen, you can drop it into a Z490 motherboard that, that says that and get PCIe 4.0, at least from the CPU to your PCIe expansion slots. Uh, that's something that, that should be pointed out. The chipset is, is limited to the chipset. So Z490 right now, the chipset still has PCIe 3.0 and I believe some PCIe 2.0 lanes uh, that come off of the four lanes that are dedicated to that chipset. So again, uh, there, there, there's some reasonable things you could assume that might happen later this year or, or next year in 2021. 
Um, I would expect when Rocket Lake launches 11th gen, it will support PCIe 4.0. It will launch alongside probably a 500 series chipset motherboards that will still be LGA 1200. Mm -hmm. um, the Rocket Lake chips will probably still slot into these 400 series motherboards and will probably provide you with PCIe 4.0 support for the motherboards that say they have it because they did, they did the traces properly for that. Um, and then if you want full PCIe 4.0 support, uh, you'd need five. You need a 500 series motherboard, so you need an LGA 1200 500 series motherboard, and that would probably have a more robust chipset that has support for that there as well. Or you know, just wait for LGA 1700, like we talked about in the first article. But um, that might that might be getting a little too far ahead of yourself. Um, so uh, that's sort of similar to like you know the the AMD model right now, like with AM4, mm -hmm. like they're they're higher end chipset motherboards that offer more features that cost more money, but still have the same socket. So they're backwards and forwards compatible. So depending on what your budget is and what kind of you know uh, kind of experience you're looking for, there's there's more flexibility at least. Um, it's just like the the motherboards are more separated by tiers of technology as opposed to different sockets. Um, which, which I guess is a good thing, but it's only, it seems like it's only going to be for this and next generation. And then it's going to switch all again in 2021. Yeah. Actually. So <clears throat> I kind of said this, um, when we first started hearing about these LGA 1200 boards that were coming out was like, I, I'm, I'm okay with this if they have, uh, you know, a three year plan in mind or something like that for this platform. So people can have some reasonable assurance that you know they're not going to get stuck or anything um it doesn't seem like it's that three-year plan i mean a, a couple generations is good it's better than it's kind of what they've been doing though yeah right? but it's 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 yeah it is kind of what they've been doing so anyway i just i just feel i just hope that they hear the feedback of the consumers who are saying like we like what amd is doing and you know give us something akin to that right that makes sense yeah and I, and I totally agree with you. Like, I think it's really weird that Intel isn't being open and transparent about this. Like, just letting people know, like, hey, we put PCI Gen 4 potentially in these boards, and, you know, in future generations it'll support it. It's weird that they've somehow allowed the, the motherboard partners, like Gigabyte, to disclose this information. Like, it doesn't seem like, like, unless Gigabyte's breaking some NDA or something, it's weird that Gigabyte's allowed to say all this, but Intel didn't say that up front to well, the, the motherboard manufacturers want to promote the work that they've done and they've they spent extra r&d time and extra time engineering this feature into the motherboard they want to be able to say it has that that's a selling point for the of board course. it's a cost for them to have done that and to not be able to say it probably doesn't make them very happy i also think someone like gigabyte who's a pretty major you know they're they're definitely the top two or three motherboard manufacturers i believe if you're looking at volume or any yeah. other um, metric, but I think them coming out and saying this, even though according to the article, it seems like the guy who said it was aware that it was something that Intel probably didn't want him to say. Um, maybe it is because there is more competition and because they're selling a lot of AMD boards. Like, you know, you know I, I, maybe there's a little bit less of that reverence towards Intel, uh, mm -hmm. With, even with the, the, the board partners now than there was a few years back because, sure. you know, that's another thing about that. Yeah. Like I said, there's so many of these 400 series motherboards. A lot of them look really nice, but if no one is interested in the CPUs, mm -hmm. then all of that's going to go to waste. Um, right. And, and that would kind of suck. So, right. Anyway, I no, I, I fully uh, I fully understand why the motherboard manufacturers would want to tout these features, but why wouldn't Intel? Intel. So I was yeah, you're right, I was thinking about that too, and I I can I can I think I know their reasons. I don't agree with their reasons, but I think they yeah. would say something along the lines of, "We don't want to hurt sales of this platform by talking about the next platform," mm -hmm. um, because in the PC, you know, in, in, in the tech space in general, people. Are always like what we're talking about right now. Everyone's always looking towards the next thing. Oh, don't buy now. You should wait for the next thing. So maybe right. they don't want to. They want to focus on what we're launching right now, not what we're launching in the future. Yeah. Um, there's probably a bit of just that old school Intel mentality of you know certain stuff that they don't disclose and 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 that. Um, and then of course there's probably a little bit of like well hedging your bets because you might have 
a pl they might have a plan in mind, but there might be things that could hold them back from doing it. If they make a promise now and then they don't follow up on that, that's going to okay. put that's going to give people even more of a reason to to say like, man, what the heck's going on with Intel? Um, yeah. So yeah. So yeah. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. But but I think people are hopefully telling Intel what what they want and what they want to see, and you know we'll see how things play out with this launch. Everyone yeah. uh, again, uh, May twentieth is the launch of the Intel stuff, so we'll, we'll we should see some benchmarks coming out then. Uh, and then in two days on the seventh, right? May seventh, yeah. we can three. we can say this, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah so. we'll have benchmarks for the 3100 and 3300X, which I got confused in my head because I think those actually go for sale. <laughs> I'm glad I asked you on about the 21st. That. You would have been never mind any off. of that though. I never make mistakes. Of course not. I never. Okay, let's We're let's move beans. on. <laughs> uh, WCCF tech article. Uh, all these articles are linked in the video description, by the way, if you guys want to uh, further reading, investigate them yourselves. Uh, this article is by Usman, and this is an interesting one about Intel's. Lots of Intel news going on right now, uh, but I'm okay with it because this is about their Shea, or the XE Shea. <laughs> Shea. <laughs> the Shea. Uh, how, GPUs. How, how satisfied would you be if they actually decided to call it that? They just call it Shea. <laughs> it that way. Shea. Because of a uh, influencer Paul Har Paul's hardware, we decided to <laughs> repronounce the official name of. Our GPUs as Shea. Trying to get it to catch on, right, guys? XE could easily <laughs> be pronounced Shea. I'm, right. I'm, I'm Team Shea. Anyway, uh, so this started uh, four days ago on May 1st. There is an Intel Graphics Twitter. They follow me. I followed them back just today. Uh, and the Intel Graphics Twitter tweeted this picture right here. Look at that. Look at that thing. Wow. That's that's not a CPU. That's a GPU. Yes, indeed, a graphics card. Where's That's this? Big. Where's this stupid link? That's I'm gonna I'm GPU. gonna go to Twitter. Here's your Twitters. All right, so this is the Intel Graphics original tweet. Uh, Silicon bring up with many tens of billions of transistors needs surgical teamwork of various engineering functions, with only remote access to labs spread worldwide. This was deemed impossible until now. Anyway, uh, so just a shot of a like, just a very interesting shot of a GPU because first off, it doesn't look like a typical GPU. It's an LGA package. Uh, they were kind enough to put a AA battery for scale right there, uh, which allowed various people, including the intrepid Usman over at WCCF Tech, to go ahead and make some estimations of the uh, total size of the chip as well as the potential usable area. 3,696 square, mil square millimeters, just about 300 shy of 4,000 for the entire package. Um, with Again, and these are just based on estimations of size from the picture so obviously these are these are these are going to be ballpark but 2373 square millimeters of usable area and this is just interesting because it's like a big old tease of course it's a product in development uh the the fact that it's lga and you know you have cpu features or things like you know there's a little triangle on the corner for socketing and everything a lot of times these are used for product development um so probably not the final form of, of this GPU that they're working on. Um, also based on like some of the, the, I mean, the overall size of the thing and some of the transistor layout here, there's some, been some speculation that we're looking at uh, multi, uh, again, sort of a chiplet design with multiple chips in there, either four or potentially eight. Um, and then of course there is the name for this thing, uh, which is the, the it's, in, it's in Hindi, but the BAP, BAP of all? Bahubali? Bahubali is is what Raja said is coming next. So that's that's the thing. This is, there's, a, there's layers here, right? There's what Intel Graphics originally tweeted, and then Raja followed up and said, this was called the BAP, I don't, I'm sorry if I, I don't speak Hindi, the BAP of all by our team. The Bahubali of all is baking as well. Let's hope the wait will be shorter uh, than what this guy put us through for the, for the movie. Um, so... Anyway, there, there's the, there's a little literal translation. This is in the article. There's a literal translation, and then there's sort of the assumed translation. But the assumed translation is that this is the Superman, uh, Superman of GPUs, Superman of all GPUs, to succeed the father of all GPUs uh, that Intel is working on. And uh, this is probably going to be uh, a HPC uh, part. So the Intel. 
graphics team has they have like a a lower power team and then they have like a high power team and then they have a, a compute team uh, that's working on server stuff. This is going to be a compute thing. Um, so this is probably going to be used for machine learning and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, there's some other replies to the tweet about some of the potential capabilities of it. But this, all this stuff is still really early and, you know, they're, they're, just, they're just feeding stuff out a little bit at a time. And maybe their goal is just to get us to talk about it, to get us talking about the Intel Shea graphics. To get to get to get the word out about it, and you know what? I'm okay with that, because um, I I thought this was fairly interesting. Also, my daughter's she's upset right now. She's mad. She's an AMD fan. Uh, she's obviously she's upset because Raja um, is now on Team Blue, working for Intel when he was originally all about that Radeon. AMD uh, must have Radeon did technology him dirty. Group. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Who knows the real story? You can only make but those assumptions. <clears throat> makes you think, though. Oh. If uh, kind of makes you think about like, what if GPUs were just LGA socketed chips standard? You know. I mean, you have to you have to wonder if there might be some use case for that in the server market, because um, these these are potentially going to go into like supercomputers, and so supercomputers yeah. use like thousands of these all right. all networked together. So um, I don't. I don't know very many of the details of the, of the inner workings of those besides the, the overall specs they give you when it comes to how many petaflops of Google Plexes that it can... Um, Computify? Computify, <laughs> yes. That's the, <laughs> the word was, that's the word I was looking for. Um, but I still find it fascinating. So anyway, uh, we will probably be seeing Intel GPUs Potentially either this one or, or potentially the uh, just the high power ones um, uh, in 2021, so next year. So still a ways off, uh, but they're also rumored to be based on seven nanometer technology. It'd be mm. funny if they like the brand new Intel graphics team was able to put out seven nanometer GPUs before the CPU team was able to do that. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Uh, in Raja, we trust. Yes. Yes, indeed. All right, let's talk about USB 4.0 uh, and how it works with DisplayPort. Uh, now, USB-C, since it launched with USB 3.0, uh, the standard for the plug, uh, has introduced a lot of pretty cool things. And there's stuff you can do over USB-C, um, such as DisplayPort. And there's already a DisplayPort alt mode for USB-C uh, that was introduced back in 2014. However, some of the standards for that are they need to be tightened and they need to be refined in order to meet the specifications or to fall within the specifications for the new USB 4 standard uh, that's coming soon, uh, as well as DisplayPort 2.0. Uh, USB 4, uh, we're looking at, what, next year? Yeah, this is again probably 2021 stuff uh, for, for both DisplayPort 2.0 and USB 4. Um, but the, so there's a USB alt mode that was already available for uh, USB type C plugs. So you could do display port over USB. So this isn't necessarily a new thing, um, but it has enabled a lot of cool features like video out uh, from phones and lots of other devices. Um, USB 4.0 is, uh, or USB 4 is fully encapsulating the display port video signal uh, in a more similar way uh, that to Thunderbolt 3 than the current means with USB-C, which is kind of more like just repurposing uh, the, right. the, the connections. So, right. yeah. This will allow them to meet standards for DisplayPort 2.0. Uh, it has a new thing called UHBR, or Ultra High Bit Rate Signaling Standards. Uh, so they're updating this DisplayPort Alt Mode to DisplayPort Alt Mode 2.0 for DisplayPort 2.0. And this is a very good article on Anantech. Anantech, if you want to dive into the tech stuff, into the technical details to the point where you think that, man, I'm, I'm dumb. Because <laughs> uh, that's often to the, the point, right? No, but it's, it's, great, it's great to read into this because uh, there's a lot of little nuances to it that are good, are good to learn about. Ryan did a good job on this article. Uh, he talks about the, the various modes that this can operate in, uh, downstream and upstream lanes uh, for the, like the actual wires going through, the twisted pairs going through, the, the cables themselves, um, 
Keep in mind that USB 4.0 is a bi-directional standard. The data can be sent or received both ways, whereas DisplayPort is a unidirectional standard. It's taking a video signal and it's sending it one way down there. So if you imagine the cable like having lanes on a freeway, you can take all the lanes on the freeway and have them going, have half going one way and half going the other way, but you're only going to get half of the bandwidth both ways, whereas make them all go the same way and then you get more bandwidth that way. I'm, I'm, I'm oversimplifying things, but that's the basic idea. Uh, ultimately, this means that a DisplayPort Alt Mode 2.0 connection is going to be just as capable as a DisplayPort 2.0 connection as far as display connectivity and bandwidth are concerned. So if you have a USB 4 cable and you have a device with DisplayPort uh, a monitor on one end with that USB and like a, you know, a source on the other side, your PC or whatever, um, you can just take any USB 4 cable and connect it there and it will work in lieu of a DisplayPort cable. Nice. Which might be fairly convenient for people, uh, having the flexibility uh, to, do, to do that. Um, you might have questions about cable compatibility. This is not going to be something that you can just take a USB 3 cable and do that with. Uh, it, it's, the article says it should largely work with USB 4 compliant cables, although VESA, who is the uh, standards body who, who governs all this, is being careful to avoid promising compatibility with all cables. And that is because DisplayPort 2.0 cables are going to be length limited uh, for passive cables. You, uh, the article said something like a couple feet, but then the other article that's about DisplayPort said like two to three meters. So maybe two to three meters for a DisplayPort 2.0 passive cable and beyond that you'll have to have an active cable and um, the components in an active cable which are ca called redrivers which re-up the signal so it can go over a longer distance uh, sometimes they're bi-directional compatible and sometimes they're not so they just need to make so uh, basically what they're saying is if they could use crappy redrivers and then it wouldn't make it that that way which is why they're not saying like every cable works that way so anyway uh, lots of little details in here which I, I tried to pull out the stuff that was so I could go cover this relatively quickly without going over this entire article. Again, this is one that I'd really recommend reading yourselves if you want to uh, read up a little bit more on this standard that's coming soon, because it's pretty cool. Um, here... I'm, I'm just amazed that you were able to condense in an Antec article into like 10 bullet points <laughs> in a reasonable time period. Oh, I, I, all day to compress all I skipped over a lot of stuff, believe me. There's a lot of stuff going on. But, um, here is the chart of DisplayPort 2.0 by itself. DisplayPort 2.0 with the alt mode, uh, which uses all four lanes in a unidirectional pattern, and then USB 4, just standard mode. So it's got the max bandwidth, and then you can see here the bandwidth uh, for USB 4 mode, because it's bidirectional, uh, drops to 40 gigabits per second. But you also maintain USB compatibility there. So it's a bandwidth issue um, between the different modes. But by using this alt mode, they can get the full 80 gigabits per second, uh, and, and, and that's all good. Also, and I believe it's in here, if you're not familiar with DisplayPort 2.0 in general, it's pretty cool. This is from June of last year, but this goes over that and shows the different signaling standards, the bandwidth. And you can see what a crazy jump you're going to from DisplayPort excuse me, 1.4, which is 32.4 gigabits max theoretical raw bandwidth, all the way up to 80. So more than doubling the bandwidth, and that's going to enable stuff like 8K video at 60 hertz with HDR support, higher than 8K resolution at 60 hertz uh, SDR, uh, 4K, 144 hertz HDR, uh, double 5K monitors at, at, at 60 hertz, I'm imagining with the daisy chaining uh, the, the display port's capable of. So, so pretty cool. And for anyone talking, you know, thinking about uh, next generation displays and super high res and all that, <laughs> sounds that sounds delicious, Kyle. You already killed that. Oh yeah. Okay. Nice. It's very tasty. All right, let's move on and talk about Windows 10X. The X. What? The X is for sexy. <laughs> no, the X is for. The X is for. I thought Windows was just doing Windows 10, and that's it was just going to be Windows 10 now, and that was all, and they were done. The X stands for. Excuse me while I update some more. Yeah, excuse me while these we switch we automatically restart your computer without you without <laughs> forcing you. Anyway, I got two articles linked. Uh, one is from PC Mag, the other is from The Verge. 
And uh, yeah, so this is sort of an interesting article. For one, I hadn't heard much about Windows 10 X, although it has been in development for, for a while. Uh, it was first discussed, I think, at the end of 2019. Uh, but Microsoft posted a, a blog post yesterday. They talked about various things, such as the massive uptick in Windows 10 usage right now because of the ongoing coronavirus COVID-19 thing. Mm. People working from home, a lot of people using their home computers, uh, or, or a lot of people just on their computers. So 75% increase in the use of Windows 10 year on year, uh, which is a good amount. They said that's more than 4 trillion user minutes. I was like, Could you give that to me in YouTube? hours or days or something. 4 trillion. That's like, a, like YouTube. an you eternity. You have 50 million watch time minutes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How many seconds? Too astronomical. How I many seconds is that, though? Can't process how much. Be four <laughs> times sixty. I mean, two hundred forty trillion seconds. Why didn't they Google, say? Fifty Google. Why didn't they say that? Two hundred forty trillions. That's even more. I know. Bad marketing. Yeah. How? Yes. People in chat are like half of those minutes are probably waiting for the updates to process or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so most There's a meme in there somewhere. <laughs> All right, so what the heck is Windows 10X? Windows 10X is a dual-screen Windows 10 operating system, which appears to be fairly different. Here's an example of a Windows 10X device with dual displays, one on the bottom, one on the top. Uh, specifically, there is a dual-screen Surface that they have been working on called the Surface Neo. I don't think that's what this is. This is the Verge article, but... There's a Surface Neo. Oh no, this is the Surface Neo right there. Which again has a another screen down here. So dual screen display, you know, built from the ground up, meant an operating system with the UI that assumes that it, there is a second display there, uh, and specifically for portable devices. But they plan to then port this to laptops. Um, but now, because of the big uptick in Windows 10 usage, and because of the uh, the, the pandemic, and because they're not they're they're not seeing a, a huge, I guess, opening for people going out and buying a bunch of new dual screen displays right now. They've decided to switch focus on the development of Windows 10X to single screen. They are reprioritizing Windows 10X development to focus on regular single screen devices. They say it's due to the pandemic, the increase in Windows 10 usage, and the potential difficulties in launching an OS meant for dual screens. Uh, the Windows 10X has a simplified interface, an updated start menu, multitasking improvements, and a method for running apps in a special container for performance and security. The overall goal is to create a stripped back, streamlined, and modern cloud-powered version of Windows, which, uh, according to the articles, both of them mention Chrome, Chrome OS, and Chromebooks as being potential competitors, which Windows sees as, as competitors as well, because uh, those operating systems are, like, free. I mean, Chrome OS is, like, free, right? Or it's at least really inexpensive. Uh, yeah. to put on a Chromebook. Um, and I know it's been something that I've recommended to people who are like, look, all I need is web browsing. I need a cheap laptop. I'm like, you can get a Chromebook for two, three hundred bucks. It right. totally, totally gets the job done for that. They do have their limitations, though. But yeah, uh, so streamlined UI, cloud-based, simplified, uh, all of this stuff really strikes me as like similar to, to, to like Windows 8, right? When they did that. Mm. And like, right. oh, we want to take these mobile devices, and 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 um, that are becoming so popular, and make an, an operating system that'll work for desktop or mobile devices. I'm not right. sure how accurate this like UI right here is. But what they took the Windows button, then they made it the entire taskbar. It seems like an efficient use of space. <laughs> and then this pops up here with some apps and websites and some recommended stuff. And then down here you got your picture of your elephant, which you always you want to have available. <laughs> it's, actually, it's a person riding an elephant, which I it's think cruel. is isn't that Absolutely frowned cruel. isn't that frowned upon? Very frowned upon. I guess upon. it depends. It depends. Not if you're a tourist, you shouldn't do that. Or so or I've if read. You're a Not true, especially if you're an elephant terrorist. Elephant terrorist. Anyway, so uh, I don't I don't know what the heck this is. Like the reason I look at it is because my thought is like, all right, is Windows 10 X eventually going to be Windows? Are the, is like, are all of our Windows 10 computers gonna be right. like, it's automatically updating you to Windows 10 X or whatever, and then the U up. UI changes or anything? I hope not. That would suck. I I disapprove. Um, 
but we'll we'll see how this goes. And uh, seems like they're yeah, like you said, they're trying to repeat the same thing with Windows 8, trying to create a cloud-based unified OS, a unified OS across mm -hmm. all platforms that uh, they they didn't get right the first time, and um, I, I guess it'll it remains to be seen if they're if they're gonna botch this one too, but um, I don't I don't think we need that. I think they're just bored. <laughs> I think they're just bored. I think. I'm trying to think of something new. I don't know. I I could see like a variant that's specifically made for dual screens. I don't. I don't know. It's it's just. It's such a small I, market. I I am skeptical. I will remain skeptical, and I hope they don't screw things up and pull another Windows 8, and then have to do a Windows 8.1, and then whatever the heck else they do there. Microsoft. Have you ever what? have you ever found value in like those dual screen like laptops or mobile devices? That's like, hey, we have like a whole other LCD that's on like by the keyboard that you can put other random shit on. Like, have I, you ever has that ever appealed to you? I haven't used one extensively enough to say yes or no. I will say that having dual screens is really really helpful for productivity. Um, all the way back when I started working at Newegg in customer service in 2005, I remember going in there and they had all these desks set up for all the customer service agents and everyone had two monitors. And I was like, what, what is this craziness, crazy advanced tech company with two monitors for every person. <laughs> and I think the CEO or someone at the time had read some article about productivity and dual monitors and how much more productive it can be and it's true like especially for customer service you can have you know a website up here so you can be looking at product information and then have the ui for like you know looking up order info and all that stuff over there mm -hmm. very helpful um yeah a lot of people have three monitors uh if you if you do stocks you have to have at least 15 in a right. in an array scattered i mean on a, on a desktop it makes yeah. perfect sense but i just mean like on on mobile devices the little like... the little lower screen there yeah like i would have to yeah. i'd have to mess around with that a little bit more to to be like yes i need that it's so helpful versus like oh, i just forgot it was there after a little bit right um, exactly yeah but anyway all right, so a couple more quick articles to go over here. We already mentioned that the AMD's new CPUs, the Ryzen 3s, 3100 and 3300X, are launching in just a couple days. Uh, I'm sorry, well, you should see benchmark reviews of them in just a couple days. But if you can't wait, there has been some leaks, and again, leaked information is not always reliable, but uh, this one is sourced uh, from Tomb Episac, the, the Twitter account that likes to go and, and tweet um, revealing information pre-launch about stuff. Written up on WCCF Tech, they basically, somebody basically took the Ryzen 3 3100, ran it at stock and overclocked, and compared it to the new Core i3-10100. Uh, the... I hate Intel's naming scheme for this series, but the 10100 is also a 4-core, 8-thread processor. So we're looking at two dual-core, 8-thread processors, uh, with the new Intel or with the new AMD 3100s launching at 100 bucks, $99, whereas the i3-10100 is $122, and I believe that's the tray price. That's the 1,000 unit price. So it's probably even going to be 125 or 130, is my guess. Um, but yeah, here, here's here's the benchmarks down here. Scroll do you down. do you do you ever wonder if like Tom Apisak? is the one like all these results are actually his? Like he's just posting his own leaks. I think he he actually works for for Intel. He's a oh, yeah. no. I don't. I I have no idea. <laughs> Intel shell. It's, Sometimes I wonder, like, what if he's just like some random reviewer who gets access to all this stuff, gets early samples, and then just leaks it, but then like you know pretends that he he leaked it from somewhere else. I, pretends I like, that the source was elsewhere. I like the the mystery. You know, like it's kind of like. If we really found out the the truth or the true info, like it would demystify it, and then we'd be like, I don't. And so, like, I think I think we should we should just let it be. Let let Mr. Tomb Episac live in his little bubble of uh, legend and and myth that surrounds him, and where he gets the information, we will never know, truly know for sure. Uh, what if he's Banksy? He's probably Banksy. That would be some crazy art. Yeah, this is art right here. <laughs> Um, we're, we're looking at beautiful artwork. Anyway, uh, sorry if the text on screen is a little small, but we're looking at the fire strike benchmark results. There's four columns. The two on the left are the, ten, are the 10, 100, uh, stock and then overclocked overclocked. The 10, 100 was running at 4.2 gigahertz across all cores. 
Meanwhile, the Ryzen 3 3100 results are on the right here. Uh, overall 16,028 and then the overclock result of 16,808. So as you can see, if you're looking at the first and third columns, uh, the stock numbers are pretty close to one another. Um, but again, if you consider that the uh, AMD chip costs 20% less, then that gives it the win. Uh, there are a few wins by the stock i3 over the uh, 3100, but uh, yeah. Meanwhile, overclocked, uh, the 3100 is, is, is winning just about everything. Again, it's a little close uh, here and there. Uh, it should also be pointed out that the 10100 is not necessarily like a default overclockable chip, uh, whereas the 3100 is overclockable on like a B450 motherboard. The 10100 here, they're uh, benchmarking on a ASRock motherboard, the Z490 Tai Chi, and ASRock as they are want to do has you know a special feature that allows you to overclock. Uh, chips that aren't supposed to be overclocked. And uh, I didn't read up on the details on that, so I'm not going to go further into it. <laughs> I didn't realize that. I didn't know that. Yeah. Intel's cool with that? They're just like, yeah, I just overclock our, our again, non Again, it's, well, ASRock has always been a little bit trickier about that with, like, you know, having special BIOSes available that allow you to do stuff you're not supposed to do and everything. Um, yeah. Are they, uh, like, do they allow overclocking on the multiplier of those? chips or is it again i apologize i do not have the, the further details about that the that. the uh what's it called where did it, where did it go it's called bfb technology as rocks bfb technology uh wccf tech has an article about all of these asrock z490 lga 1200 motherboards and it's in that article somewhere, and that's as far as I got before. I was like, I need to move on. I'm running out of time. So, so, that, so there it is. Anyway, point being, they're testing this on an ASRock Z, Z490 Tai Chi motherboard, which is probably at least a $200 motherboard. I would guess more like $250 or $300, bucks, which isn't necessarily the motherboard that you would drop a $120 CPU into, for one. Um, and also, again, you know, we're still dealing, dealing with Intel's overclocking requirements, which is that you need a Z490 chipset motherboard in order, order to overclock, as well as a KSQ CPU. So it just it drives that price up for anyone who's interested in overclocking. Overclocking might be a feature you're not at all interested in if you're spending 100 or 120 bucks on a CPU. But in my opinion, I'd rather have it there and available than not. So yeah, I appreciate that on the AMD side, it's not like, oh, you're going to have to spend 180 bucks on a motherboard instead of 120. It's like, oh, you know, just get a B450 chipset motherboard. Yes, there's cheaper ones. There's the A320 or A whatever the stupid other chipset is, but I never recommend that because you can't overclock on it. And they're typically not that cheaper, that much cheaper anyway. And AMD's like, and here's also an included cooler that you could reasonably overclock a little bit with. That is also convenient. Yeah. I'm not sure if the 10 100s will. I, I imagine they'll come with a stock cooler. Probably. Yeah, but it's an Intel stock cooler. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, there's also. So, what are the what are the differences we're looking at? Uh, the 3100 was 12 percent faster at stock than the than the 10 100, and it was one percent faster uh, than the than the overclocked 10 100. The overclocked 3100 was 26% faster than the stock 10100 and 13% faster than the overclocked 10100. So it overclocked better and, and all that good stuff. Uh, meanwhile, there's also some, some time spy results where the results were similar. Um, there, actually, the stock 10100 beat the 3100, but only by a few points. So, yeah. Anyway. Thought that was interesting, but of course this is all probably lies. So wait, wait two days for uh, actual benchmarks to come out. Finally, Ampere is the code name, the key name, the the secret secret sauce name of AMD's sorry AMD Nvidia's next generation GPU architecture, and they have finally rescheduled their GTC 2020 keynote. This is actually from April 24th, but we played video games last week, so we didn't talk about it. So I wanted to point it out. <laughs> 
but you might notice the first words here on their newsroom press release, which is get amped for latest platform breakthroughs in AI, deep learning, autonomous vehicles, robotics, and professional graphics. They went there. Interesting choice of words. Amped, Ampere. Obviously, they're talking about Ampere, and it's going to be announced at this event. Uh, it's, a, it's bounced around a little bit. Originally, they were going to do the GTC 2020 keynote on March 23rd. Then it got delayed and postponed and various things, and it was up in the air. And finally, they have reset to May 14th. So... Nine, a little over a week away, 6 a.m. Pacific time. You will be able to watch the pre-recorded keynote. I want to emphasize pre-recorded because I, it's, I feel like we're getting. I feel like we're having stuff taken away from us, right? We're gonna get. <laughs> we're gonna get Jensen. And he's gonna probably be on a stage, and I don't know if they're gonna put in crowds cheering or anything like that. He's <laughs> probably gonna be wearing the leather jacket and everything. I, I, I can't see him not going with that. But what yeah. we're not going to be able to see is those delightful moments during the NVIDIA live streams, like when something goes wrong and Jensen gets mad, and it's it's <laughs> just, just loses his shit. It's just it just adds this level of entertainment value that I feel like we're going to be missing because it's because it's, be it's pre-recorded. Polished. Yeah, it's going to be all polished and everything like that. So there will be no random outbursts or yeah. threats of firing employees on stage. Exactly. So you know. We'll take what we can get, I guess. Um, but the article says Wang will highlight the company's latest innovations in AI, high performance computing, data science, autonomous machines, healthcare, and graphics during the recorded keynote. The headline here says professional graphics. In the article, just says graphics. I'm sure that's just a minor issue there, but I would expect that they would do those announcements in that order as well. They'll, they'll come around to graphics last, they'll be like, oh, one more thing. And then they'll be like, Ampere, and something like that. So hopefully this means that NVIDIA is finally going to be uh, giving us some more information directly about the 3000 series graphics cards that they presumably have been working on. Uh, they've had plenty of time. Give us give us Ampere AMD and and make us happy. I really uh, hope that like anytime Jensen tells a cheesy joke on stage that they have like a fake laugh track. Yeah. <laughs> fake laugh track. <laughs> <Or> just, <laughs> I could see a bunch of ways that they could make it really, really fun, funny, but they'll probably they could, they'll probably stay a little bit more tight laced, tight laced in corporate because yeah. it's Nvidia. They they're they're a fairly large company. They have they, they, have, they have investors and <laughs> all that kind of thing. They have. Keep them happy. Yeah. So all right, that's all I've got for today, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. Again, cool. if you want to read up on any more of these articles, they're down in the description. I apologize. I didn't have uh, more stuff going on for this week. Uh, that was I a good amount. I thought that was No, we had a good amount. I didn't, I'm just saying we didn't have any other segments that we did or any of that, that other oh, u yeah. unique stuff that we like to do on Awesome Hardware. Yeah. Yeah. Not by design. I am still very limited on the amount of time I have because I'm still watching my daughter a lot of the, a lot of the week during the week. So i um, which is lovely and is wonderful, but um, it has taken a little bit of the time away from my planning for this kind of thing. But uh, anyway, thank you guys for watching once again. If you're on YouTube, hit the like button, of course, and uh, check out our stores. Links are down in the video description for both of those. And we will continue the party over on Twitch for uh, a little bit longer. So uh, if you want to hang out with us longer, go over to twitch.tv slash awesome hardware. Uh, if you're on Twitch, stay where you're at. And... That's all. Goodbye. Thank you. Adios. Farewell.